The subject matter of dialectic chaos basically means that somebody caused something to have something happen that the result will be what they want. They'll cause a catastrophe and set into motion change. And if it wasn't for them causing this catastrophe, the change wouldn't happen. Kind of like 9-11. The second song on the record is called This Day We Fight, and uh, I'm sure a lot of you, like myself, were, were a big fan of the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Uh, oddly enough, Led Zeppelin was really a big fan of Tolkien, too, so I love that, that uh, medieval-type uh, netherworld stuff. The song This Day We Fight it was something that Aragorn was saying to his troops right before he was ready to engage in battle. It was a battle cry, if you will, and he was saying, you know what, I don't know what's going to happen but we are not going to die today. We may die tomorrow, but not today, because this day we fight. Okay, the next song I'm going to describe for you is a song called 44 Minutes, and this is about a bank robbery that took place in North Hollywood back in 1997. Now, I'd already moved to, to Arizona, so I wasn't living there anymore at the time, but Nick was still with us at the time, I'm pretty sure, and um, he was back living in Los Angeles, and he lived near where the bank robbery took place. Now, 44 minutes is the amount of time that the gunmen were able to walk the streets with impunity, with AK-47s, with huge cartridges, with hundreds and hundreds of shells in there, and full body armor. Now, most body armor guys go in and wear that, they'll wear the vest here. These guys were all the way down to the cuff, all the way down to the ankle. They were impervious to damage, and at the very end of the song, um, it talks about how the, the gunfight actually climaxed. Uh, a member of SWAT had gotten into a car and was racing forward to the truck that the uh, suspect was in. He thought he was going to rescue a, uh, a fellow officer or a, a, you know, a hostage or a victim. So he's in the car with three other SWAT guys. They race to the truck. They had no idea they were going for the bad guy. They pull right up hood to hood to the bad guy. and the guy that I talked to on the phone, uh, Sergeant Stephen, uh, I think his last name is Gomez, he's with the LAPD SWAT department, and um, he told me he got out of the car and his gun jammed, it had what's called a hang fire where the shell sticks inside of the cartridge and it wouldn't uh, properly eject from the gun, so his gun was rendered ineffective. Somehow he cleared it, got under the car and started shooting at the suspect's feet, that's the reference to Achilles' heel, because he shot the guy in his heel and he fell to his knees and then he kept hitting him until he was uh, pronate on the ground and they came around the front of the vehicle and uh, by then he was already um, he was already dying 44 minutes what a heavy song the next song is called 1320 this is a song about drag racing <clears throat> 1320 is the length of feet in a quarter mile that is the universal length of uh, drag strip in the United States and um, the car itself in 1320 is a nitro fuel funny car. Now the difference between a top fuel car and a, fun, a, a nitro funny car is that one is uh, using gasoline and the other one is using nitromethane and when you compress nitromethane in a piston it basically it's like to put it in simplest terms it's like a little bomb and with a car it's kind of like when little boys like their farts and um, with the difference and this little poof um, it is quite substantial when you figure there's eight ignitions in that block whenever uh, you get an RPM. Uh, at least this is what I'm told. So um, when, when you get that times 8,000 RPM, there's 64,000 concussions or, or however many the math is. You tell me if I'm off on it. I do know I was there and if you weren't, I know better. It is a magnificent sport. It's uh, one of the greatest things you will just talk about pure rated power. My favorite driver is John Forrest, and he's got some really cute daughters, too. You should check out his website. The song is called Bite the Hand, and, and when the record is closer to release time, we're going to decide whether we have uh, the title change and have that feeds in parentheses, or we change the whole title to Bite the Hand that feeds. I've been known to change my titles up until the last second, like with Cryptic Writings. That record was supposed to be called something else, and when we got the artwork back, it was rubbish and, and so we had to change the title and the artwork. Um, for this song, Bite the Hand, uh, in, in the States people um, 
after World War II, things started to change. People would uh, start committing fraud and, and, and misusing bankruptcy in, in the states. And uh, one of the things that they would do, people with integrity would live check to check. And, and you hear people say, God, I'm living hand to mouth right now. It's hard, but I'm making ends meet. Well, then uh, came the advent of credit card fraud. People now live from check to credit card to check. And then you started seeing these people that belong on Jerry Springer and, and uh, stuff like that, um, that live from credit card to credit card to credit card to credit card. And they've completely abused the system and they're the ones that are responsible for the economic problems uh, in the system, draining it uh, with credit card fraud. And so this song is about people um, who uh, are manipulating and misusing the system and then Good guys like me, you know, who who will work their butts off no matter what. I, I will never file for bankruptcy. I think that if I ever got myself in trouble, I'd work it off. I've, I started with nothing. I'm going to end with nothing. You've given me a, a lot of gifts, and, and I appreciate that. This song uh, is merely about the economy and, and what happens if you bite the hand that feeds. This next song, Bodies, is a, a song that, uh, again, with the titles, you know, um, I think I'm just going to call this Bodies. I, I like the one word title. I think it's pretty cool. And, and believe it or not, this song actually has been hanging around for a little while. When we recorded United Abominations, we had uh, a little piece that you heard on the net. Uh, we put it up and it was uh, Sean jamming out the end of Bodies. So you already heard part of this song. And what the chorus is uh, in the song is, it's entertaining for me because uh, it says, uh, and all along the road, all the bodies left behind may all have been good friends, just not good friends of mine. And, you know, it's really interesting when I will be in a concert and, and someone will show up who's a friend of a friend or one of the other band guys, one of the crew guys, and they have somebody that they invite there. They're either completely gracious and cool or they're complete utter rectums, and it just you know, it's the hardest thing to deal with people like that. So, Bodies is uh, the riff, and you've heard before, like I said, the uh, rest of the song is um, uh, obviously new to you, and I hope you like it as much as we do. It was a great classical progression at the end, and this is uh, part of the areas where you can see Chris Brunkick really shining. And besides the fact you've already had your nuts cut off from guitar solos, um, this, if any of you have anything left, this will surely get it. Now for the title track. This is Endgame. Very scary subject. This is about uh, our ex-president of the United States, George uh, W. Bush, and um, the fact that he signed into law a bill that uh, the Senate didn't know about, the House of Representatives didn't know about, Lou Dobbs from CNN knew about it, and his uh, commentary for his news program that night was, the night President George Bush just signed a bill into law that uh, nobody knew about. Uh, not the Senate, not the House of the Republicans, uh, House of Representatives, nobody. <laughs> and I was like, what? So I had to look into this, and I found a document that basically said that President Bush um, had okayed the use of force to detain legal, lawful U.S. citizens if they contribute to the wrong party. Now, um, Contributing to a terrorist group, yeah, I could see where that would be uh, probably bad form. But, I mean, contributing to terrorists, like contributing to fear, you know, contributing to the group is, is what you need to evaluate. Now, in Arizona, Janet Napolitano had just said that if you donate to Planned Parenthood or anything like that, I can't remember what the exact group was she was targeting, but she said if you donate to something like Planned Parenthood, that's terrorist. I thought it was absurd for a woman who's pregnant who's deciding to have the baby or not, a person who uh, wants to support her right to have a baby or not, and is going to donate money to support the group that has the baby or the group that doesn't have the baby, that's not terrorism. Now, guys killing doctors in abortion clinics, that's, that's not cool. That is an act of, I believe, terror, because terror is sure fear. And I think that it's unfortunate that somebody who has gone to medical school and has gone to the extent that they do to help women who 
want to make the decision to bring a life into the world or not. I, I'm a Christian, so for me, it's I, I, I have a conflict here. But I got to tell you honestly, if my daughter was raped, I would have no problem with her getting an abortion. If she was pregnant and had a uh, uh, something that was wrong, where the doctor said there was something wrong, and to consider that, she asked me as her daddy, I would say, you know, you need to pray about it and talk with your husband about it, but. You know, considering how hard it is, um, I, I myself would probably opt for aborting. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't love life or anything like that. It just means that um, I believe we should have our rights. And in, in the States, there's uh, something you need to look up if you're an American. You need to know what Endgame is about. The hardest part of letting go and Sealed with a Kiss is another dot 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 song. It's really hard for me to do those because it's really got to be a connection of two completely unrelated ideas within the same body of music. And um, the first example of that um, was uh, on one of the, the first songs, Killing Is My Business and Business Is Good. Um, <clears throat> although that doesn't really support the theory that I just said, going to the end was where we really started to see stuff like Holy Wars the Punishment do. And um, with uh, this particular track, The Hardest Part of Letting Go, um, it's about when I met my wife. And you know, she'd said, we've been married 17 years, you've never written a song about me. And, and I, I said, yeah, well, I have actually. You know, just the love songs I've written, you're the one I've loved for the last 17 years, so it was about you. And she wanted a song that was about her, to her, and, and I wrote it. She didn't like it. And um, the reason is because of the second half of the song, Sealed with a Kiss. That song is about the cask of Amontillado from Edgar Allan Poe's writings. And in that story, he takes this person down to a cellar, to a wine cellar, gets him drunk. The guy's name is Fortunato and he chains them to the ground in this wine cellar and then places bricks in the opening to the area where he's got him chained, basically bricking him into the wall, which is what immure means. To immure somebody means to brick him into the wall, and that's why he's that lyric in the song. So um, you can see where she wouldn't like it because she thinks I'm going to brick her into a wall. But it's just the same thing like with uh, In My Darkest Hour when I wrote that song. I wrote the music when Cliff had died. I loved Cliff. He was a wonderful human being. And for those of you that didn't have a chance to meet him, what little I knew of him, what little time I spent with him, it was a gift. And I know I'll see him in heaven. So um, that song, the music, like I said, it's for Cliff. The lyric is between me and Diana again. So. Um, the second half of Sealed with a Kiss is not about Pam, it's about Edgar Allan Poe. And uh, when I played the song for her, you know, when I used to listen to it, I would, I, I would get so emotional because it's such a moving part. And then after she told me that she doesn't like it, and you know, now I listen to it, it kind of gets me mad. So, um, here you go. The hardest part of letting go is Sealed with a Kiss. Head Crusher is the first song that Sean Drover actually had some contribution with bandwidth with music. And Sean is, is very active in Megadeth. He's very dedicated to you, to me, to the band, to the music, to, to the scene. And uh, the great thing is uh, I saw the potential with Sean just like I've seen with a lot of our players. Every once in a while someone tricks me, but you know, not very often. And Sean was a great gift. He was finding an enormous chubby little diamond in the rough and, and he's just been a blessing to me, to the band and to you the fans like I said. Um, we've tried to write songs together before and it didn't happen. Uh, the time wasn't right. This time it was right. We had the song Head Crusher uh, submit musically by Sean and another song that he had and I didn't like the other song and, and this song I didn't really grab me because it reminded me of some old mega stuff. But the cool thing was uh, when the record was done Chris had co-wrote some stuff in uh, The Hardest Part of Letting Go. And, and I was so impressed with that because, you know, Chris had turned in some stuff too, as did James. And Chris's stuff was really funky and James's stuff wasn't that good. Um, the producer, see, with me when I hear uh, music, I'll say, is this good enough? And if I have a problem with it, I'll say, will you listen to it and hand it over to the producer and uh, uh, co-producer, in this case with Andy, or hand it over to management 
say, will you listen to this? And um, that's what I've been doing ever since euthanasia, when we started running into all this songwriting difficulty. So I gave the stuff to Andy, too. He didn't like James' stuff. He didn't think that Chris's stuff was, was right, although Chris's playing was fantastic. During the hardest part of letting go, Chris collaborated and he shined. He needed something to, you know, it's like a whip on the stallions behind to get him out of the starting gate. He's running now. And um, it made me feel so good I wanted to revisit with the other guys and, and help him get some music in because I know how difficult it is to write with someone else if you don't really know where you're going. So I figured I'd really give of myself to them and really help work with them. And Sean, I listened to his song and I went, well, here's the reason why this one part uh, I don't like because it was it was almost identical to the beginning of uh, Take No Prisoners. So I listened past that, didn't even listen to it anymore, and consequently the next couple of riffs were the ones that were the ones that he got in this song. The lyrics I wrote when I was in Hall and I was driving to the gig and I saw on a power box on the side of the road a poster that said uh, there was a museum of historic torture devices, and I thought, wow, that's got to be interesting to <laughs> see a bunch of weird people in there. But uh, um, I, I also was listening to an episode that had happened on Ozfest where uh, the Austin's camp had somehow gotten in a skirmish with Iron Maiden's camp, and um, Sharon had written a letter, and it was an open letter, and she signed it to real Iron Maiden, and I thought, wow, that's interesting. I'm going to go see what an Iron Maiden looks like again, because it's been so long since I've seen it. And I know what it looks like. It's in my mind. When I saw it again, I was like, oh yeah, that's right. But I also saw a lot of the really intense torture devices. Supposedly the most intense is the head pressure. But there are other really intense things like a pyramid that they had guys sit on. They pulled their legs down to make their butt yawn over the top of a pyramid until they died. And for me, that just seems incredibly painful. They had another thing, they were like little shoes that girls would wear and the bottom of the shoe had a spike sticking up in it. So they had to stay on their tiptoes the whole time. And as soon as they put their foot down, it would go into their heels. And the spike was about two inches long like that. And I'm sure that's probably threatening to a couple of you guys. But um, it, for me, it was really intense looking at it. And when I wrote the song, the lyrics I had pressure, it was exactly about that torture device. Now, <coughs> we also, when the record was over, having Chris, uh, having Chris have his songwriting and the hardest part of letting go, having Sean have his part in um, Head Crusher, I wanted to try and revisit things with James. So I called up the label and I said, you know, we're really going to try and fix one last song. Uh, James has something. It's too late. Sorry. Oh, come on. Can we? Okay. What can we put on, on a B-side for you know, Japanese release? Not too late. You can do a download. It can be an online thing. Okay. James, let's do this. And it didn't happen. I don't know what happened, but it just didn't happen. Session ended, James left, and it's, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, all I know is that um, we have a great record. I, I love the music on this record. I love all of the playing on it. We went back and said to James, um, go listen to the record again, see if there's anything on there that you would change, okay? And um, honestly, we went back and listened to it, and he said, I got two things I would change, and, and he came back and goes, after listening to it, there's nothing I would change. And I gotta agree, I think the bass playing on this record is exactly what the record called for. How the story ends is, um, is a song about the book, uh, The Art of War, by Sun Tzu. Uh, when you're in battle, sometimes you lose sight of your uh, leaders. Uh, sometimes you can get away from uh, your sight line too, and you can't see. Also, sometimes they use smoke on the battlefield uh, where if you were using some kind of visual um, signaling for you in battle, if there was smoke, you were pretty much at your enemy's uh, hands. So uh, in the book, The Art of War, good generalship talks about how to lead your troops. One way, if they can't um, hear you, um, they use flags. That's why you see in some of these old Renaissance things where they'll have people using pennants so much, using flags to wave. Uh, in the Ten Commandments, they used uh, that movie, they used flags to show the architects how to drop the stones and everything. <coughs> if you're at battle and you can't see the flags because there's fire and smoke, what do you do? You have to listen for your commands. So they would use drums, they would beat out the drums of war to tell the soldiers what to do. Um, and for me, uh, Listening to the song, uh, 
it, it just is a battle cry. It talks about Megadeth rallying the troops and getting ready to come and fight to be able to stand on stage. It's a proud place for us to be out there playing for you. And, and how the story ends, um, it, 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 the, the chorus pretty much sums it up. It says, destroying every town, light it up and burn it down. Uh, you may not like it now, but this is how the story ends. This is the last track on the song, and this song used to be called Nothing Left to Lose, and then it was Nothing Left, and then it was Nothing Left to Choose, and then, uh, well, you couldn't go any weirder than that. So I was looking at the lyrics on it, and again, like I said, changing song titles, um, <clears throat> there was just something very corny about calling that Nothing Left to Lose. You know, I love Lemmy. Uh, I saw in his arm <clears throat> something like Born to Win, something to lose or born to lose or something you know and, and um, that's what I thought of when I thought of the song title I thought wow this is something that I know guys get tattooed on them and I didn't want to do it because it seemed like a, a song title after a tattoo would be a tremendously tragic step down for me in my lyricism so um, I thought well what is the point I'm trying to make in the song point is, is that, you know what, you cannot take away my right to go insane. If I want to be a nut, I can be a nut. And sometimes I've behaved very nutty. I've never crossed that line into lunacy yet, but there's a, a very thin wire between genius and being a, a, a nutter. And um, I like to have fun. I like to push the, the limits and stuff like that. But uh, for, for me, when it comes down to um, acting insane and being in, in control, um, I love being in control. That's why those narcoleptic drug days of the 80s and 90s, I look back at that with uh, uh, no disdain at all. I'm actually proud that I survived it. But um, the cool thing too is now uh, being able to see everything that you guys have made possible for me in my life and my career, everything that's happened with this record, everything that the label is doing to help us. Um, it's, it's just, this is one of the greatest periods of my life, and, and I'm just really glad to be here right now and be able to share it with you. We've got some surprises coming up for you. Be sure and stay tuned here at Roadrunner and over at the official Megadeth site. Uh, also, you can find out what we're doing with Gigantor over at the Gigantor site and, and at the Liveline. But um, for now, that's it. The songs are done. I think I've told you everything you need to know. We're going to be coming over here touring soon. And uh, we've got uh, a lot of things planned up our sleeves. We're going to be going over to uh, Australia to play with Slayer in New Zealand. Also going to be doing some dates in Japan. Uh, we'll do four dates there and we'll be heading back home. And I know we have some more dates in North America. We're going to be doing a uh, run of dates too um, in secondary and tertiary markets. Tertiary means the third levels. And um, after that we're going to take off for the holidays and plan on doing a huge tour of the States again in, in uh, January, February. Of course we're going to plan on coming over here for summer festivals next year. We've missed them all so far. But um, we're ready to come and play for you. We love being here. We love playing for you, regardless of where you're Well, there are some places I don't like to play, so if you're there, tough shit. But um, other than that, thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed this, and I'll see you later.